Welcome guys, welcome guys to another video. Uh, happy Halloween! You know, I know it's a little bit eerie here. It's uh, it's at night here, so I'm filming this uh, late at night. So I hope you you will forgive me for there isn't that much of a good lighting here. I hope you see me. Um, now today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue our series, Napoleon. Today, I promised two videos. Here I am. Here I am. Uh, today, what we're gonna continue? Uh, by the way, thank you for for the comments, everybody. I read every single one of them. I try to respond to every single one of them. Uh, leave likes, subscribe. Really like you guys. Um, now, uh, where we left off when it came when it comes to Napoleon was when he was retreating from Moscow. He uh, he was uh, basically surrounded. He was able to you know uh, uh, pass his way through uh, this sort of blockade if you will, uh, on land, you know, uh, and then he fled to Paris. In the last video, he fled to Paris to reorganize his, uh, his army and his mindset, I guess. And today we're going to see what happens, you know, 1813, let's go. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. I mean, you burnt it, you know. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Ooh. Russian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army. But he left for the Kingdom of Naples, oh, a bitch. hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Uh, what a bitch. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, mm. and now faced odds of four to one. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Mm. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Yeah. Bernadotte. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known. What's insane is that his family still rules Sweden to this day. Known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, of course. which is what he now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution. Let's, let's, let's see all the coalitions. First coalition, 1792 until 97. So that's Russia. I think that's Prussia. I might be mistaken here. Is it Prussia? I think the first one is the first one. Okay, never mind. Austria, Russia, England, Spain. Second coalition, England. Dude, he nicked. He fucking fucked all of them. Third coalition destroyed. Fourth coalition, fifth coalition, and now with an army of thirty thousand know. troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. Yeah. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. 
but with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain. So basically, Britain is the to bank. Build an army of 80,000 men. Yeah, Jesus Christ, it's all the people. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, mm. summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers and overhauled training, tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. What a backhanded comment, these animals. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Curiosity okay, Stream. Yeah. Home I'm gonna of more jump than two in. And a half Yeah. In a year, in a year, you know, everything went away. Fucking sucks. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain 16,000 Marines and 80,000 men of the National Guard yeah, he's not down, force, the guy. were transferred to Germany. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. Okay. They were young and raw. Two thirds were teenagers. Jesus and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. Yeah. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. Wait, when Napoleon left to Paris know. for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène yeah. had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of mecklenburg schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Mm. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. I mean, isn't, uh, isn't Napoleon married to uh, an Austrian uh, princess? So... Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. Jesus Christ, the guy, you know... The Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. Really? The guy just fucking killed 500,000 people? on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to what pneumonia happened? on the 28th pneumonia. of April. That's always what happens, man. You, you survive some in insane odds, you survive the First World War, you survive the Second World War, you survive fucking insane odds, and then pneumonia takes you down? like. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home, their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. Jesus Christ, so what happened here? They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg with 35,000 men 
to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Mm. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. Jesus Christ, that's true, that's really true actually, he had to take risk, as in wars and business. As, as Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, and the I Allies have... faced a predicament. To risk Calculated battle against risk. Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. Mm. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. What the fuck? Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. Everybody, dude, everybody dies by cannonball in this in this world. Nobody gets killed by muskets. Or, <laughs> you know, everybody, freaking cannonballs comes out of nowhere, kills you, or like, how many marshals were killed like by cannonball in the shoulder, uh, this guy, Bessier, uh, another guy in, in Spain, uh, I forget the names, sorry guys, but, you know, I, I, I remember, like, one guy, I remember making the comment that someone was shot in the shoulder, I'm like, okay, he's gonna be fine, and then the guy says, by cannonball, by the way, I'm like, okay, never mind, and even, I think, didn't Napoleon, get hit by a cannibal, or was it by a musket? I, I think it was a musket, but it's insane. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's Third Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. I mean, how much charisma did Napoleon have to time and time again raise hundreds of thousands of people in a uh, conscript? And for people of France to still idolize him to this day, because his charisma must have been insane back then, because you just lose, you, you make so many mistakes. You go, to, you go to Spain, you go to Russia, you lose millions, hundreds of thousands of men in very you know, not so much, uh, not so uh, smart decisions. And then people are still with you no matter what. You're the emperor, we're with you till you die, you know, it's... At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Mm. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border. 
hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French two infantry days. struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. A freaking misunderstanding. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Let me guess. Cannonball. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. <laughs> His slow, painful death oh. deeply upset Napoleon. Fuck, that sucks. If you're gonna get, yeah. if you're gonna get hit by a cannibal, just hit me in the face. Make it quick. Pura continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. Things are gonna turn because it says the road to Leipzig, so I'm gonna guess that he, Napoleon has to go back to Leipzig for like a final battle. So he, is he gonna lose a bunch here? Or? With both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Whoa! I thought he was gonna say a refuse. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Of course. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, <laughs> since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Yeah, they were married by both. Austrian what Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace, and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he travelled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. I mean, he, he's, he's asking for a lot when you think about it, because, like, give ter territories back in Italy, that I could see, just that. But then you want to take Poland, and you want to reform, like, the, uh, sort of, or at least disband the Confederation of the Rhine? Like. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. Yeah. That's a good advice, I guess. On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the 6th... To be honest, I'm sorry I'm pausing so much. I'm sorry, guys. But if it was me, 
if I was in his shoes, and I know it's very easy to say all that in retrospective, you know, if it was me, I would have done all the right decisions. Yeah. Uh, I would have taken the piece, to be honest. Uh, and for the only only reason that I would have been able to hang on to France proper, and I would have been able to, uh, you know, fix a, sort of a, fix my attention to Spain, because Spain, you know, it's coming. It's the coalition so, and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical yeah. advantage of three to two, yeah. and a new strategy the Trachenberg Plan. Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks and wear down French forces, until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including £8 million in silver and gold coins. 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons <laughs> of rum and brandy. The most important. Uh, this is basically the UK is like the US during the Second World War. It's basically like the factory and the bank of the world. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a it's major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it a, a pale shadow but... of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. War on how many fronts? On the 15th of Three? August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. Okay. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden sending Van Damme's 1st Corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counter-attack. Okay. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's 2nd Corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. <laughs> what a but rule. I mean, soon arrived, it's a rule all about, imagine how much respect they had for Napoleon. Oh, I don't want to say respect, maybe respect, but apprehension that that rule was put in place, that he was so, so good that people were like, you know, don't even try it. Don't even try it. You know, if you see him run, you know. <laughs> that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Udino had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men, but in three days of heavy combat, around Grossbiren, 
he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Mm. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Jesus! Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns, for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced, and advanced wherever he was not. Yeah, I'll be pissed as well. Please. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching, and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. <sighs> Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. By October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, Whoa. the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the yeah, Kingdom I mean... of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides, and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Pussy. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden, and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. No! Really? That, what? Oh my god! Oh, this is so annoying. This is an incredible... Uh, uh, I can't wait to see what happens, man. What the hell? Um, what's called?
when when you when you suggest that something spectacular is about to happen, I forgot the word, but this is this is insane. The next battle will be like the battle that decided the war, and I'm guessing the way the war went, it didn't play, it didn't go into favor of Napoleon. But the strategy that the Allies used is very, <laughs> it's very like you know, it's very you know, in terms of like if you're gonna go with the whole uh, you know, 18th, 19th century honor, knighthood, it's very pussy like, you know, like you know, if you see Napoleon flee, you know, but it worked, so I guess there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I did. If there wasn't as many battles, you know, there wasn't as much, you know, but it was much more of basically painting the picture of the way things were going in Europe in 1813, and it wasn't going well for him. You know, there were multiple, you know, chances where he should have done something, in my opinion, you know. Maybe he should have taken the treaty with Austria and all the other allies. Would they have agreed? Would they have stick to it? Uh, would they have sort of declared war in a seventh coalition three years later. I don't know. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned as much as I did. I can't wait for the next one uh, tomorrow. Don't worry. We're here tomorrow. And we're going to watch... Uh, what's the name of the next video? Uh, Wellington Triumph. Victoria. Okay, so we're going back in time. In Spain, I think. Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you guys next time. Leave a like. See ya.